Hello everybody and thank you for joining me for this Kabbalistic look at Rosh Hashanah. We'll be looking at Rosh Hashanah and the subsequent Hagim of Yom Kippur and Sukkot with the teachings of Rav Nachman of Breslav who brings in a mystical approach to this time of year. To begin I'd like to look at Rav Nachman of Breslav's analysis of Teshuvah, of repenting and returning to God, which of course is the ultimate goal of the entire month of Tishri, that we reset our relationship with God and try to do better in the future. Rabbi Nachman Rebrestov brings into the idea of Teshuvah a Kabbalistic idea of Ratzov Ashov or Ayil Venafik. And he says that we need to be familiar with this concept. We need to be conversant with it. We need to do it well. What is it? It's a counterintuitive idea of approaching God and drawing away from him. And he does the same thing with us. And we might well ask, why don't we just approach God and stay with him? The answer is twofold. Firstly, if we just go closer to God the whole time, then if ever we experience a reversal and we don't know how to handle that, we'll be in trouble. We won't be able to react to adversity, to failure, and will not be able to pursue our relationship with God in the future. At the first sign of trouble, God forbid, we'll be down and out. Furthermore, he says, the idea of being able to find God and serve God, even as we withdraw from him, enables us to do something very special. We don't just withdraw from this world. We don't just withdraw from the evil within us. On the contrary, we grab onto this world at times when we withdraw from God. And we use these times to sanctify both the less desirable parts of ourselves and the less desirable parts of our world altogether. Because we are able to serve God not only when approaching him, but also when we fall away from him, we can ensure that we can bring other things along with us and ensure that our entire life is full of service of God. There is no time, even when we fall, when God's presence is absent from us. And indeed, King David himself mentions this in the Psalms, where he says, If I go up to the heavens, there you are. And if I go to the nethermost depths, Behold, you are there too. King David was able to find God both in the times of his highest elation and also in the times of his spiritual despair. And we too can follow in his footsteps and find God wherever, whenever we are, whatever's going on, however well or badly we've done. And we can discern this leitmotif of drawing closer to God and coming away from him in our service of God throughout the Hagim, throughout the month of Tishri. Let us begin with Rosh Hashanah. We know that the main mitzvah of Rosh Hashanah is the blowing of the shofar. And each set of shofar blasts consists of three parts. An opening to kia, a straight single note, a shivarim, a teruah, or a shivarim teruah, a broken note, and a further to kia, a further simple long note. The two Tukia notes have no form. They are simply there. They exist in the simplest form. They represent different stages of inarticulateness, of in, an inability to express oneself. The first Tukia is the lower one. It expresses the dumbness of an animal who has nothing to say, who is un incomprehending and dumbstruck when faced by something like the glory of God. This is how we start each set of shofar blasts. We start off with nothing, with nobody, not even with ourselves. We barely exist vis-a-vis -vis God, and certainly when it comes to spirituality and measuring up to the revealed majesty of his greatness on Rosh Hashanah, we can't say a word. The middle set of blasts, the shvarim, the teruah, or the shvarim teruah, the three shorter notes, the nine very short notes, or the three notes and the nine very short notes combined. These represent our crying over our dumbness, over our inability to express ourselves, over our spiritual smallness, our stunted spirituality. And as a result of that crying, that regret, that search for something better, that search for a better self and for God himself, we can graduate to the second tikkia, which is also inarticulate, but for a different reason. It's not inarticulate because we don't know what to say to God. 
It's because we are so great, we are so elevated, we are so close to God, that words do not suffice to express ourselves anymore. Once again, we are dumb, but for a different reason. Not because we're too small, but because we're too great to express ourselves. These three aspects of the shofar sound, the first tekiya, the middle shavarim or turah, the middle broken note, and the second tekiya, are rather like the letter aleph. The two tekiyot represent us in the lower world and the upper world, the bottom part of the aleph and the top part of the aleph. The shavarim, the turah, or the shavarim turah, represent the middle vav of the aleph, which joins the two yods. This middle vav represents our efforts to move through in this world from the lower to the higher state of inexpressible spirituality. Rosh Hashanah is at the beginning of the month for a particular reason, because in this day of Rosh Hashanah, there's not only something going on spiritually, there's something going on in our cosmos as well. No other Chag begins on the first day of the month except for Rosh Hashanah. And there's a reason for that. Rosh Hashanah is the recommencing of our year, which is determined largely by the sun. However, Rosh Hashanah is also Rosh Chodesh. It's the beginning of the month of Tishri, which is marked by the moon. And the point of this is that on Rosh Hashanah, the sun and the moon are united. And in this uniting of the sun and the moon, this recommencing of the lunar cycle and the solar cycle, we find an expression of the two tekiot, the two states of spirituality, one too small to express itself, one too great to express itself. The moon represents us in our lower state. It wavers, it comes and goes, it has no light of its own and can only reflect the light of the sun. In itself, the moon is just a lump of rock. And we acknowledge on Rosh Hashanah, through the fact that the lunar cycle begins again, that this is part of who we are. But we also recognize that in this moment of Rosh Hashanah, we can latch on to a greatness which is like that of the sun. The sun is not dead. The sun is an incandescent, colossal ball of fire. It is an ongoing series of unimaginably large nuclear explosions. The sun represents the constant greatness of God himself. And through the work of Rosh Hashanah, we can latch on to that greatness. We can almost, as it were, become one with it. That is when we approach God, and the moon is when we are coming away from him. So Rosh Hashanah represents these two aspects, our lower state and our upper state. Our lower state when we are away from God and we serve God still with the Tekiah. Our upper state when we are approaching God, which we express with the upper Tekiah. And the middle Shavarim and the Teruah of the Shofar represent the fact that that we can make a transition from one to the other. And indeed, as we move from ayel to nafik to ayel to nafik, from ascent to descent to ascent to descent, from ratzo to shov, from running towards God with full intent to shov, turning away from God, in each of these states, we have to find God. The shofar mitzvah encompasses all these states because we find God in both of them. And the sun and the moon coming together on this day of Rosh Hashanah, express the fact that whether we are like the sun, mighty and alive, alive with God's own majesty, or whether we're like the moon, wavering, reflective, almost entirely inert, whichever it is, they're all included in the spirituality of Rosh Hashanah, because spirituality includes both these states of approach, ascent to God, and departure, descent away from God. It's hardly surprising that since Rosh Hashanah is the defining start of the Chagim period, that we will find this pattern of Ayav of approaching God and coming away from him, in other times as well. So, for instance, we find it on Yom Kippur, when God enjoins us to eat on the eve of Yom Kippur, which is a mitzvah in itself, we remember that at this time we are coming away from God. We are serving God by eating and drinking, by entrenching ourselves in our physical nature and bringing that over, as we're supposed to, into mitzvah by using our bodies to serve God on the eve of Yom Kippur. On Yom Kippur itself, we progress from that descent and through that descent, through that departure away from God, 
to a new ascent. On Yom Kippur, we like angels. We've reached the number 10, the completeness on the 10th day after the Rosh Hashanah, which began it all. And in Yom Kippur, we don't eat, we don't drink, we don't wear proper shoes so that we don't have a proper footing in this world. We don't engage in marital intimacy. We don't care for our bodies with washing and um, anointing ourselves. We get rid of all the luxuries, all the beautiful, wonderful things that are of this world because we're so otherworldly that we just can't relate to them. That is Yom Kippur. That is the ascent, which is a natural follow on from the descent on the eve of Yom Kippur. Like King David said, when we descend, we find God. And through finding God at our lowest ebb, we can then come with him to the highest heights of spirituality. And we find this again, believe it or not, on Sukkot. On Sukkot, at the start of the cycle of Ayah we leave our homes. We exit. And a departure in Judaism, as we've seen, is redolent of departure from God. Our homes are holy places. Every Jewish home is a miniature temple. And when we leave that shelter, it's a scary moment. It's a descent. But where do we go as a result of that descent? We enter into the sukkah, which is a place of incandescent spirituality. Such a holy place that there are many things that we can't do in there. We can't have a toilet in a sukkah. We can't engage in marital intimacy in a sukkah because the place is too holy. There are some who won't even sleep in a sukkah precisely because it's too holy a place for us to behave in such an animal fashion as to sleep. And we're supposed not to engage in idle chatter in the sukkah if we can help it. It's a place of spirituality. Through our descent, through our leaving the home, we can enter into the sukkah and become much higher as people. And even in the Arba Minim, even the Lulav and Etrog that we take on the first day of sukkah by Torah law and in the rest of sukkah by rabbinic law, even there we find this notion of Ratzov Ashaf, of approaching God and coming away from him, of Ayavanathic, of ascent and descent. Because when we take the Abba Minim, we wave them upwards and we wave them downwards. The upwards represents our spiritual ascent towards God. The downwards represents our spiritual descent away from God. And again, they are all included in the mitzvah because they all have an important part to play in our spirituality. And furthermore, when we move the Lulav and Etrog away from ourselves and towards ourselves, that too represents moving away from God and coming towards God. I of Anafik is the hallmark of the entire spirituality of this time. It is a Gideon concept that we have to try to bear in mind, a paradox that we seek to reconcile throughout Tishrei and please God through the rest of the year as well. Ultimately, the entire month of Tishrei is a story of ascent and descent. We start off with ascent from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, and then we descend through the more earthy time of Sukkot. And then ultimately at the end, in Simchat Torah, we ascend once again as we triumphantly finish the Torah and begin it again. And thus our entire year can be, as we descend into winter, come forward into spring. This is the way the Jew lives. And if we live this way, we never need be downhearted, because we know that even in our lowest ebb, God is there, spiritual ascent is there for us to take. Thank you for listening.